today I am just very excited about this topic and I hope that you come away from today's discussion and I hope it is a discussion. If you've got questions, please toss them out there right in the middle of this, uh, this talk here. Uh, I hope you come away from today's discussion feeling like, you know what, I understand why smartphones are big and going to get bigger and I can play in this space. I can do something about it. Uh, today, I'm actually going to demonstrate doing an iPhone app. We're going to do a little mashup. Uh, we're going to use Google Maps and, and put together a, an interesting little app. It doesn't do a lot, but uh, you'll see how powerful the tools are, how easy it is to get going. And, uh, but I want to talk about some of the trends and some of the issues in the mobile space. We're going to talk about the rise of mobile devices, the importance of context in both an informational and a social setting. We'll just discuss what those are. I'll talk a little bit about strategy for developing mobile apps and then we'll do that hands-on. And of course we'll have the Q&A afterwards if you want to stick around and get some refreshments uh, we, can, we can talk a little bit more. And again, any, any questions or comments at any point you should raise your hand and, and we'll take those. Now how many of you have a mobile device with you right now other than a laptop? Okay, a couple of hands went down. All right. Uh, how many of you, of you have some kind of an iPod class device, a music player? How many of you have a smartphone that has a touch screen? Okay, how many of those are iOS devices? Android devices? Okay, see, I'd raise my hand for both because I have both of them in my pocket right here, right now. <laughs> an Android, a Nexus S, and a, and a 3GS sitting here. Um, why do I need two phones? Because that's the kind of geek I am. Um, how many of you have a tablet device? Brand? iOS? Android? One Android tablet? All right. Which one? Samsung Galaxy Tab 10. Samsung Galaxy Tab 10. Do you like it? Yes. Yeah. Big, beautiful screen. Oh, yeah. Uh, you love watching movies on there? Never done that, actually. Oh, never done that. Never watched the movies on there. But the Galaxy Tab 10 is... Uh, Actually, I've got a friend who has a Galaxy Tab 7. He lives in Austria, in Klagenfurt, Austria. And uh, he plays the flute and he leads the orchestra. He's kind of the boss of the orchestra. And the reason he loves the 7 and won't go to the 10 is because it's just small enough. He can sneak it up there and he can read his books and things while uh, he has downtime waiting for the, you know, for the opera to get to the part where he has to play the flute again. Um, anybody here have a Windows Phone 7 device? Oh, we struck out. All right, Microsoft has a ways to go yet. Okay, mobile devices are everywhere, and they're going to get bigger. Let's, let's look at a few facts. About 75% of the world's people carry a wireless phone. That's a huge number. We're about to have 7 billion humans on Earth. 75% of 7 billion, that's a big number. Um, about 45% of mobile phone owners download social networking apps. How many of you have downloaded the Facebook app? Okay, that's a lot. Now, it turns out that about a third of, of Android and iPhone users in the United States are using apps like the Facebook app before they even get out of bed. That's an interesting comment. 31% um, of Americans prefer SMS over a voice call. Does any, do any of you prefer to get a text message rather than a voice call? Don't, don't be shy. Okay, a few of you do. And those who send and receive at least 50 text messages, uh, text messages each day, 55% of them prefer SMS over voice. We have a shifting dynamic going on here in the mobile arena. 39% um, of smartphone owners use their phone while going to the bathroom. We won't ask for a survey here to see how we compare. Um, but I do have a question for you. Do any of you want to receive location-based ads? A few? Sure. Yeah. I do. I actually want to see location-based ads because I have this feeling that if I'm close to some place and I'm going to lunch anyway and they're going to give me some money off on that, on that lunch, I might be interested in that. More than 50% of mobile phone owners want to receive location-based advertising. That's an interesting comment. How many of you want to receive web advertising as you're cruising through websites? Does anybody have Adblock turned on in Firefox? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, this is an interesting comment that over 50% of mobile phone owners want to see those location-based ads. Okay, another thing that, uh, another uh, 
uh, phenomenon going on here. A, a Google study pointed out that we really never stop searching on our mobile devices. Um, now, it's a little bit hard to see with the, the contrast here, but the red line is mobile and the blue line is desktop. And what they're doing with this first graph is they're showing you that over the early years of desktop search, there were some really big dips here and here and here, really big dips in desktop usage. But the red line is much more smooth, at the mobile usage. Early mobile search has just been going up and up and up, and we don't see the same kinds of dips that we saw in the desktop search. Now, by time of day, if you look at the search traffic by time of day, you can see that, okay, in the wee hours, desktop search is almost gone. Mobile search, though, is, is multiple times more uh, heavy than the desktop search in the middle of the night. Even in the middle of the night, even at 3 in the morning, there are lots of people doing mobile search. That kind of makes sense. Your mobile device is always with you. And you have questions, and you ask those questions pretty much any time. Uh, by day of the week, you see over here in the lower right-hand corner, there's a big dip for desktop on the weekend, which makes sense. The desktop isn't mobile. It doesn't go with you. So on the weekend, you're probably not as close to it, unless it's a home desktop. But mobile search, uh, it increases on the weekend. Interesting. We never saw, stop searching on our smartphones. Now, there are a number of studies that, that say we have now crossed the point at which we're consuming more web data through our mobile phones, our smartphones, than we are through devices like desktops. Now, um, the thing about these mobile devices is they continue to add more and more functions. They become more and more powerful. What's new in the iPhone 4S? Anybody know? Siri? So you can speak to it and ask it questions, tell it to do stuff. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. What else is new in the 4S? Okay, it's faster. Yeah, better processor. In fact, it's two cores instead of one. So you get twice the engine going on there. And the network is faster as well. If, if you're on one of the blessed carriers, you get a faster network connection. Uh, so we continue to add capabilities to our devices. Uh, it was interesting to me to use Delta's mobile app to, to go to security and say, here's my, here's my boarding pass, and it's just a little QR code, one of those things that you see in the lower right-hand corner here. Just a QR code, and they scan it, and in I go. Um, we continue to use mobile devices in places where just a short time ago we were using paper or some other solution. Here's what the deal is with mobile devices. They're almost always on. They're almost always with us. These aren't things that we share. Sometimes I'll hand my phone to my wife or, or to somebody else to make a phone call. That's rare. And I actually feel uncomfortable when I hand it to somebody else. And it's not a germ thing. It's not this OCD thing going on. It's a, uh, I, I just, it's my phone. And it's kind of a part of me. And I think a lot of us feel that same way. It's almost always with us. It's almost always connected. We're getting network connections in more places increasingly over time. Uh, maybe I'm up on a, on a mountain someplace back in the wilderness and I don't have a data connection, but those places are getting fewer and farther between where I don't have a data connection. There's really a very compelling value proposition in one little tiny device in our pocket. So you've got voice, you've got text, you've got email, you've got web, you've got turn-by-turn -turn navigation, you've got the ability to Google something at any time. Somebody says a word you're not familiar with, you just type it into Google and all of a sudden you've got all kinds of information about that term and you can contribute to the conversation in a very interesting way. And you can sound very smart because what you're doing is you're not, you don't know all of this stuff. You know how to connect to all of this stuff and how to pull it together and use it just in time. It's a great entertainment device as well. Uh, I can't tell you how many parents of young kids I've seen, well my wife, she, we're grandparents now. I have a granddaughter as of January. and. Um, my wife has a nice screen protector on her iPad, and the grandbaby likes to use, she loves this little baby rattle program that has things jumping around, making noise, and flashing bright lights. And when she shakes it, it plays drums. Um, it's a great entertainment device, too. And it changes the way that we live our lives, and we can prove that it changes the way that we make decisions by measuring consumer behavior. Consumer behavior says, what am I buying? 
Now, Google is one of the most successful companies ever at impacting consumer behavior. You all know this. I may have said that at the beginning of the semester when I came and spoke. Google affects the way you buy stuff. You go Google it before you buy it. You do a lot of research, and they control a lot of the gateway to that information. Now, um, who is it that influences consumer behavior more? Is it your close personal friends and family, or is it people who aren't necessarily friends but with whom you spend a lot of time? What do you think? Do you listen to your mom and your brother more, or do you listen to your coworkers or your, your peers at school more when, you, when you're going to go buy something? It kind of depends on what the thing is, but yeah, peers maybe is a little bit uh, better answer. It turns out that according to an MIT study, um, it's the people with whom you spend a lot of time. And if you can simply gather the information that Jane and John spent some time together, and you can see that over time, you can watch the transfer of ideas going from one person to the next. And you can see how, how information and how um, decisions get propagated through a community. Now, um, nearby people are an, an important part of what we're going to call your context, the environment in which you find yourself. And you make decisions with respect to your context. If it's raining outside, that's a part of your context, and you make a different set of decisions associated with rainy conditions compared to sunny conditions. I was going out of town for a couple of months, and I wanted to have a good camera to capture my, my memories as we went to Austria for two months. Um, I taught a class on Android development out there. That was really a lot of fun for me. Um, but now, how did I make that decision? Who do I talk to? Who do I trust? My grandfather used to say, oh, well, it comes highly rec recommended by the manufacturer. Everything does, of course. They love their own stuff. And so you can't listen to the manufacturer because they'll just tell you good stuff about their own products. Um, are you going to talk to your mom? Is she the one who's going to influence you on which camera to buy? If she has one. If she has one, maybe. If she, if she takes pictures the way I take pictures, maybe. But she likes to have a small, compact camera, and she takes a ton of pictures. I was looking for a little bit higher quality photos. How about your best friend? Is your best friend the right person to ask about cameras? Mm -hmm. Not always. Not always. What if your best friend's a professional photographer? Yeah. Isn't he gonna, or she going to recommend the most expensive camera? Yeah. Okay, if they're, really, if they're smart, they'll try to guide you to what's right for you. But what you're really looking for is, you're looking for, what do people like me choose to do? And if I could go and survey the world and say, what do people like me choose? That would help me understand what some good possibilities are for me to consider as I narrow down my research. So, um, this camera, it, it's a pretty good camera, but it's certainly not a professional camera. I could have spent a lot more money on a camera than I did on this one. But this was good enough for me. Um, okay, cell phone usage. Um, not only does it tell us who is nearby, and, and not only does it know something about our social network, but also it can reveal a lot of other things. There's a very interesting study. I've got a shortcut to, uh, to a Wall Street Journal article right over here. And I would invite you all to go read this. I think it'll scare you. I think it'll surprise you what you can find out from a cell phone. Um, so you don't need to write this down. Josh has the slides and he'll post them later. But uh, go read that article and here's some of the things you'll find out. If you can monitor enough data coming from the cell phone and you can map that out over a big enough time period, you can actually detect subtle signs of mental illness that people are exhibiting because of patterns that you see in the various kinds of data that are going through that phone. They were able in this one study to predict movements in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And uh, they were able to predict it with 87.6% accuracy. And this was simply based on Twitter messages that were going through the phone. And they looked at the sentiment. Were these positive or negative comments that people were making over Twitter? And simply by doing a sentiment analysis of the text, up to six days in advance, they could get 87.6% accuracy on predicting where the Dow Jones Industrial Average was going. They were able to measure the spread of political ideas through a community. It's kind of, um, curious, but how do they calculate it? So the question is, how do they calculate it? You mean calculate sentiment? So, 
87.6%. Well, okay, so they simply said, uh, if we look at the sentiment, uh, so we measure each Twitter message, and we say how positive or how negative, was this person really in a down mood or in an up mood, and you just simply plot that out, and, and you, you compute an average of all of the sentiment of the messages, uh, that correlates to the Dow Jones Industrial Average to a certain degree. I, I could tell you the exact statistics there, but uh, that's basically what they're doing. Um, so you could, simply by two people being close to each other, you can expect that there will be a certain transference of political ideas, because people are going to talk. That's what we do when we're together, we talk. In Belgium, um, they were able to look at the cultural split that's driving some historic, uh, a, a historic political crisis, and they noticed that the Flemish-speaking and the French-speaking groups almost never talk to each other, even when they are living right next door to each other. They're typically speaking to somebody within their language group who may live much farther away. And they looked at cell phone records and were able to figure this out. They were able also to detect, detect flu symptoms before people even realized they were getting sick, just by changes in the patterns of how people were using their cell phones. So what I'm trying to say here is that your cell phone knows a lot about you, or it can. It's got a lot of data. Because it's with you all the time, it provides a window into, I was going to say your soul, but that's right, not the right word. Um, it provides a window into your activity in a way that very few other devices have a chance of doing. Now, if you have an internet connection, we can infer some very interesting things. Number one, location. That's a big deal. Your phone pretty much always knows where it is. Because if you're talking to the cell towers, we can triangulate. And we can say within a kilometer or so, I have a pretty good idea where you are. Um, oh, and even before that, if you're connected to the internet, anybody, let me just go pull this up, anybody can uh, go find out your location. If you go to maxmind.com, okay, let's see if this pulls up here. Okay, they've got this geolocation technology, and they have a little demonstration here. Uh, if, if you simply use a service like MaxMind, and you look at the IP address, the internet address of a, of a browser who's coming to you, you can pin them down, their location, to about the city level. So if I'm talking to websites, they can figure out about to the city level where my location is. Now there are ways of, of uh, prohibiting, uh, inhibiting this from happening, but just having an internet connection gives you a rough location fix. But now if you're connected to the cell tower, they've got you within a kilometer. If you're connected through a Wi-Fi access point, there's a huge database that Apple and Google have, have created that knows all kinds of Wi-Fi access points. And simply by saying, okay, I can see the following access points right now, uh, they can give you a pretty good idea of where you are in the world, most of the time. And then there are GPS radios on these things and, and other newer location technologies as well. So your phone can know pretty accurately where you are. And once it knows where you are, it can know how high in the, in the world you are. Are you at the top of Mount Everest or are you at the kind of 4,500 feet above sea level here in Utah? It can figure out now by hooking up to databases What's the weather like where you are? What's the cloud cover like? Do you need sunglasses? Um, it can figure out what's near to you. Are there buildings? Are there, are there some natural uh, things nearby? Are there events that, that you'd care about because they're nearby in, in time and uh, you'd like to know about that? And if we start keeping a history of your interactions with the internet, now we can build a much better picture of the kinds of things that you do. We can figure out where you're traveling, how fast you're going, um, and where do you go frequently? How many times have you been here in this room? I mean, think about it. It's likely that you're going to be here in about another week. And your cell phone probably could figure that out if we put the smarts to it. And it could say, well, I know you're going to be here in another week. Um, maybe there's some other information that I can combine with that knowledge to provide better service to you. The other thing that we can start to figure out is who else is like you? Now, because you're all in the same class, you're like each other in some way. 
you're like each other in the sense that you've enrolled for the same class, you probably exhibit a lot of other similarities as well. Um, here are some other things that your cell phone might be able to figure out. What are the businesses that you interact with? Are there any organizations you belong to? Um, where is it that you live and where do you work? Um, and, and what is your social network like? Now, when you gather that kind of information, you're communicating a ton to, to people who, who you let inside the, the walls of your cell phone. We tend to exhibit mathematical precision in how we repeat our behaviors. So with 94% accuracy, one study was able to predict, independent of age or gender or how far people were traveling, it was able to predict where they would be in the future. Okay, do you do, so that's 19 out of 20. 19 out of 20 hours. Are you doing the same thing repeatedly? Where do you go on Sunday? Where do you go on Monday? Where do you go on Tuesday? I mean, you see patterns repeating. And your phone can observe that and capture that. Um, the social network. If your friend has defected from one mobile carrier to another, you're five times more likely to do that as well. So some of the cell phone carriers are starting to say, let me study the records and let me look at my social networks. And if there's somebody who has just switched, maybe I can get their friends to switch. Or the opposite, maybe I can give them a special offer to try to keep them so that they don't switch because their friends just switched. Now, so an open research question is how do we make sure that our users have the right level of control over all of this information? Um, this summer in my, in my class in Austria, one of the students wrote a, a mobile app that would take a look at the schedule, take a look at the GPS location signal, and it would say when they're in the building and the schedule says that they're supposed to be in class, let me turn off the ringer automatically. Have you ever had your cell phone go off at a time that was kind of embarrassing? It would be cool if it could just recognize, you know what, now's not a good time to ring. We're not going to do it. I think we can get there. Um, now, anybody remember Microsoft Clippy? Okay, was it a friend or was it an irritation? An irritation. If you go search Clippy, you'll find all kinds of jokes. Some of them fit to print, but some of them not so much. Um, Clippy was, was intelligence gone awry. How do we deliver the right level of intelligence? Certainly not the Clippy way. Okay, here's your humor for the day. I'm going to read this little joke that I've got. Uh, this is Mr. Clippy in a military helmet. Okay, so think drill sergeant. I'm Kalo, your new assistant. From now on, you'll speak only when spoken to, and the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be, sir. Do you maggots understand that? And there's only one choice, which is, sir, yes, sir. Okay, so um, Clippy was too dictatorial. Clippy didn't wasn't really helpful to, to users. Clippy was really an irritation. I think that what we need to do now, though, is we need to say, all right, so intelligence in the small is a good first step. We've got to move beyond that. We've got to start thinking about bigger applications. And Siri is pushing in that direction. Right now, it's not that great. It's kind of cool. Um, some of my students in my iOS app class, they said, well, Siri is life-changing. I thought that was gushing a little bit too much. But uh, anyway, it's, it's a big deal. But we've got to figure out how do we scale up our intelligence and really do good stuff. Here's what I'd like to be able to ask Siri. Siri, would you please figure out which doctor I should go to for the following set of symptoms? And can you make an appointment for me that fits my schedule? Um, and I need a ride, so figure out when my sister can take me to. And, okay, something like that. That's intelligence in the large. That would be a big request. We still have a lot of work to do there. But mobile context awareness is here to stay. It's an enabler and a mu multiplier when you can say, you know what, I see where you are all the time. I know what you're doing, roughly. Um, I can see the conditions around you. I can pull all these databases together. And I can know a lot about you so that I can serve you better. But I think we're still decades away from the really, really smart apps, like the, the scenario I just described. But the future definitely is going to be mobile and connected. Now let's talk a little bit about developing apps. Um, so, 
if you, so let's say you want to be an entrepreneur in a, in a tech space, and you're here in the Tech Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, so at least you're somewhat interested in that topic. Um, you know you're going to have a website for your, for your startup. Everybody has to have a website. Well, it's starting to become the case that you almost have to have a website that's good on a mobile phone because so many people are going to come through mobile devices to your site. So, one of the easiest ways to do an app is not really to do an app, but just to go and recognize, you know what, Sally here is coming to my website from Safari on an iPhone. Let me present a somewhat better version of the site for that iPhone Safari browser. This is the fastest, easiest way to get a good user experience out there. But it gives you the least amount of control over the hardware. It's not going to look like a native iPhone app, and it's not going to have that same level of performance. On the other end of the spectrum, you can say, well, you know what? Let me sit down and develop a fully native app that is written in Objective-C and uses all of, the, all of the tools and all of the hardware on this iPhone. That's, exp excuse me, that's expensive and very complex. But if the app requires it, that will give you the very best user experience. And then there are hybrids between those two approaches where people have put together large libraries of functionality that's pre-programmed, and you can kind of pick a chunk off the shelf and plug it into your app. And um, there are various approaches to, to hybridizing those, those two ends of the spectrum. Um, but if you want to get the very best user experience, you're going to have to write some pretty gnarly code. And if you want to get a quick experience, you can have your web programmers do that for you with just a little bit of extra work using your website that you already have. So uh, there's a whole range of things that you can do. I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. Let me tell you about my Scripture Citation Index. Back in 2004, a colleague came to me and he said, Steve, I have this, uh, this Scripture Citation Index. And he had it printed up in spiral bound. And it had, um, if you open up this, this book, Inside of it, you see Genesis, in chapter 1, verse 1, and then you have a list of all of the places in the Journal of Discourses, and in the Improvement Era, General Conference Reports, and in the Ensign, General Conference Reports, where that scripture, Genesis 1-1, was being used. And he said to me, you know, I, I don't want to just put this on paper, I'd like to put it on CD-ROM. Can you help me figure out how to put it on CD-ROM so that I can share it with my friends? And I thought about it for about two seconds, I said, no. No, you need a website. That's how we share things. This is 2004, baby. You know, we got to have a website. <laughs> and so we put together this website. Let me just quickly demonstrate it for you. And I come over here to, okay, still loading the index. Come over here to Old Testament, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And here I can see President Tanner in 1978, October, on page 46 of the conference report. He cited that scripture. And I click on it, and it pulls the talk out from LDS.org. And I highlight the verse. And now, if I'm working on a talk, this is a great resource, because I can get quotes from all kinds of general conference talks about the scriptures that I'm thinking of using in my talk. In fact, just a few months ago, I was doing a talk, and I had put two scriptures together. And I thought, yeah, that's kind of clever. And it turns out Elder Oaks had done this a long time ago. And I was able to find his quote and, and cite him and use his words, which were probably far more eloquent than anything I was going to say. So that was kind of a cool experience for me. Anyway, um, that's the website. But now along comes the iPhone in 2007. And we have these touch interfaces. And then a year later, they open up their app store to third-party apps. And we start thinking, OK, maybe we need to do a mobile app. So we developed an Android app. Um, and we had, so basically the sequence is, on the Android, you, you uh, get this grid of all the books. You tap on a book and you get the verses. And then you, you click on one of these citations and pull up the talk. It took me about, oh, I'd say three or four months to get the prototype out here. I had a student helping me on this one, Dustin Graham. He's now graduated. Um, it was a lot of fun. I've had over 60,000 downloads of this app on Android. And right now, it's listed as a five-star app. And I love that. I love going and reading the comments that people put up there. And that's how they pay me. It's, it's free. There's no advertising. Um, I'm not, we're not doing this to try to make money. This is a labor of love. And the way I get paid is by looking at those, I guess it's an ego, an ego uh, <laughs> trip or something like that, right? 
I just love seeing the, the good comments, the positive feedback. And then we said, okay, well, we've done the Android. We better do an iPhone app. And uh, now the iPad app is coming soon. I've been working, so, so with the iPad, you can split that display and you can have the index on the left, kind of like the, the website does, where the iPhone is too small to be able to split it up like that and see the talk and the index at the same time. Anyway, that's coming soon. It has really been a blast to work on this thing. Um, and I've learned a ton, but one of the interesting things is that I learned that I was, it's something like five to six times more use of the citation index when I made these mobile apps available than before. People say, I enjoy using the mobile version more than I enjoy using the website. But the website has more functionality. That was an interesting observation to me. So, um, my point here is that you can apply similar designs to the different platforms, but it does take some work, and I've, I've worked awfully hard digging into how do I program all of these things. Oh, and uh, Elder Christofferson actually highlighted this as one of the study aids that are available uh, on page 39 of the October Ensign. And we've seen an uptick in usage. People actually read the Ensign. Uh, and I can tell because our traffic is up after that article hit. Okay, so enough of me up, sitting up here uh, rambling on. Should we build an app? Let's build an app. And I'll show you how powerful the tools are because we're not going to have to do very much. Here's the idea. We want to capture a latitude and a longitude, and then we want to click a button, and we want to have Google Maps come up to that latitude and longitude that we have entered in. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to launch Xcode, which is Apple's development tool, and we're going to say, I want to make a new project. OK, and my new project is going to be a single view application. We don't need to explain what that is, but we're going to call it Map It, and we're going to put it in Oops, edu.byu.businessmanagement371r. Okay, and now, better turn those off. Next. Okay, so it wants to know where I'm going to store this thing, and I'm going to store it in my business management 371r program, or folder. And up comes an app. And I hit the play button over here, the run button, and it's going to load this thing that is generated onto the simulator. Okay, so up comes the simulator, and there's my beautiful app. Obviously, it doesn't do very much. It shows me a gray screen, which is uh, not so helpful. All right, so let's go and, and let's, uh, let's build some things here. So I, I have a drag and drop capability. If I click on this viewcontroller.xib file, this is the interface that they're displaying, which is just gray. Well, let's change that. We need a couple of labels, so I'm going to drag and drop some labels, and and they're giving me some guides so that I can lay it out in a way that Apple says is kosher. Uh, I'm going to want a button on the right-hand side so that I can click map it. And we need a couple of fields where we can type in text and gather our latitude and longitude. Okay, so this is just drag and drop stuff. If I double click here, I can say lati latitude colon or Longitude, colon, and now let's arrange these just a little bit nicer. Okay, so we've got that in the center, and now let's make this label look a little bit better because it's got to look good. That's one thing about mobile is that it's got to look good. And then I want this button to say map it. Okay, now there's one more piece, and that is that what I want to do after I get a latitude and longitude is I want to get, I want to display an embedded web browser inside of my app. I want to go load a URL into that web browser and say, go load this map at this latitude longitude, please, Google. So I'm going to go find my web view, and we're going to drop it in here and make it a little bit bigger. Okay, and so now we have that. All right, the next piece is that I need to, and let's see if I can make this happen, right? Yeah, you control it. Okay, good. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down the control key and I'm going to drag from that control over here to my code file. And I'm going to say I want to call this the latitude field. I want to connect that into my program. And I'm going to do that again. I'm going to have a longitude field. It's asking for permission for access to my location. But uh, those are the coordinates for the Tanner building. 
and so it's able to pull this up. And now I can use all of the, so I can, I can zoom in and out with a pinch to zoom stuff. Okay, and I can move this map around, and I have all of the capability of a web browser sitting right here. So, simply by combining some native controls with a, an embedded web browser, I can get a fair amount of functionality here. And I can, I can add some custom controls on top of that thing. Okay, sorry about the little glitch there. This happens a lot. Um, there, there are some little, I have to be honest, there are some little things that can cause you big trouble in app development. And that's why you want somebody who really understands programming to be involved in this. But the tools are extremely powerful and provide you a lot, just like you can Google and you can get answers to your questions. You can Google and you can get a snippet of code that you can just drop right in. And programmers today do a lot of that. And so if this is the kind of thing that intrigues you, it's not that hard to learn how to do this to some level. Okay, let me make sure there aren't some slides that I had left off here. Okay. Here's my concluding slide. Here's my message for today. Mobile devices are everywhere, and they're growing. The mobile experience can indeed be a lot better than the non-mobile experience. And that's because you're able to incorporate intelligence about what you're doing, what your context is. And they can serve you in a more convenient way than, say, the laptop or the desktop is doing. And the tools that we have available for doing mobile development are sophisticated and they continue to get better. The amount of work that Google and that Apple have done in their, in their operating system frameworks is tremendous. And you're really pulling together huge pieces of functionality that you don't have to develop yourself. It's more of an assembly and a connecting process. I think everyone here needs to understand and really own in their lives something about mobile. Um, I'd love to teach you more about this in the Information Systems Program, but even if you're not somebody who gets into uh, development, you ought to know something about what goes into it. And, and if you want to do a tech startup, you're going to have to understand the mobile space. It is just too important to bypass right now. So I hope that you'll take some time to inform yourself about that and look at what some of the tools are that are out there. Um, so thank you for your attention today. I'll stick around for Q&A for anybody who wants to talk.